What's it like in London at the moment? It's very sunny. It's beautiful. Ah, hello. I'm I'm Thomas Keneally, and I'm the Booker Prize winner 1982 uh, of the strange novel um, Schindler's Ark, uh, which uh, became known as Schindler's List after it was made into a movie by Steven Spielberg. I went to buy a briefcase. As I looked in a, a bag shop called the Handbag Studio, a burly man of middle age emerged and he said, uh, so it's 105 degrees uh, out here and you won't come in to my air-conditioned store? Are you scared of me? This man turned out to be a survivor amongst the Schindler Juden. Uh, I entered and uh, the store, uh, I was a bit scared of him because he was such a strong personality. My Australian credit card uh, had to be checked. They had to call all the way back to Australia to check that it was kosher. But in the time that was happening, uh, my host in the handbag studio, the owner of the store, Leopold Pfefferberg, uh, said, um, what are you doing in Beverly Hills? I told him I was staying round the corner, that I'd been doing a bit of, been to a film festival, doing a book, bit of book promotion. And he said, my God, I read this book by an Australian. He said, I read a review in Newsweek. Sol, didn't I tell you I read the review? He said to another survivor in the store. And Sol said, how would I know what you've read? So I knew I was in another world of humour and in another subculture. He began to tell me then, soon after, that he was a Holocaust survivor. He first asked me, did I know certain people in Sydney? So I didn't know his Jewish friends, and he said, they and I uh, were rescued by uh, a Nazi. But although he was a Nazi, he saved us. So to me, he's Jesus Christ. But a saint he wasn't. And then the story began. He took me to his filing cabinets. And in the 60s, MGM had tried to make a movie of the life of Schindler while Schindler was still alive. And at that stage, Paul Deck had put together an archive of Schindleriana. These included copies of SS cables made illegally by Schindler's secretary, Mietek Pemper. Uh, they included photographs uh, taken by the assistant manager of Madrich's factory in the concentration camp called Pashov. They included testimonies by people about their experience of Schindler. And in the mix was this list. And he pointed out where he was on the list in a concentration camp and where his wife was. For the first time, I looked at two people, an exuberant one and a more restrained one, and I thought, here you are, middle-aged people. You're not toxic to me. You're not toxic to your community. And yet my betters had decided that you were a virus on Western civilization and had to die for its help. But there was a time when you were under that death sentence for being an Untermensch and an Unterfrau. And the vividness of Poldek's character just brought it home to me. Uh, I was lucky enough to be looked down upon and discriminated against somewhat as a group called the Irish. They were considered to have a strange religion, believed in saints, believed in papal infallibility, bore watching. That being the case, um, uh, I was aware that there was 
a, a space between us and the next group, the Aboriginals, who were a group called the Thangadi, who lived in our valley since the last ice age, or since before the last ice age, and who um, uh, had been the original possessors. But we didn't see them as that. They were the only crowd that were below us. And I found that useful uh, in the writing of this book. But when I say in the writing of this book, when I first encountered the story and this originating archive that was in Poldek's two drawers, much of which he got copied out that weekend and gave to me to bring back to Sydney. Uh, in that time, I was thinking, I can't do this because, first of all, Sydney wasn't quite where, like New York, where everyone knew Jewish humour and knew the Jewish community. Secondly, I wasn't metropolitan European. I found that this, the story of Schindler was a terrible, uh, detailed, a terrible dance between Europeans and the uh, Jews. And in a way, I'd been out of it. Uh, and so my initial reaction was that I couldn't do it. But did I want to do it? I was conscious of why I wanted to do it. It is the old story of what Stalin has said to have said to one of his officials during the uh, Ukrainian famine in the 30s, uh, when an official said, there's a tragedy in the Ukraine, uh, there are a million dead. And Stalin corrected him and said, ah, a million dead isn't a, a tragedy. If one man dies, it's a tragedy. If 10 million die, it's a statistic. Now, uh, I think that's great truth. We can imagine one death and the death of the beloved parent or the hated parent and the death of the beloved partner or the hated partner. It, it, it's always a big deal. But six million dead, as in the Holocaust, evades the intimacy of our imagination. In Schindler's case, he was dealing with 1,300 people to 1,500. We could look through him at the experience of individuals. And as he moved through the system, we could see every phase, every aspect of the Holocaust he touches, but on a manageable scale for the imagination. And I realised that early and I thought, boy, this is a fantastic story. I could tell you my father served in the Middle East for three years and he sent me back taped up cake tins full of Nazi memorabilia. So at the age of six and seven, I was receiving Nazi holsters, a Nazi flare gun used at Adam Halfer or El Alamein, incredible stuff he was send, sending back to me. I was thus only one degree of separation from Rommel's Africa Corps. And I think my fascination with that regime and of how you could be Christians and Europeans and then the question of the Jews, my fascination with it grew out of that. I interviewed these survivors, a wonderful family called the Corns in Sydney, the musician Rosner, and his wife was a concentration camp uh, survivor too, and the Argentinian and Dr Rosley, and my cup already overflowed. I didn't have enough to write a book. So I knew that I'd be recording bringing all these recordings back to Australia, having them transcribed by a typist in Avalon Beach, New South Wales, about a block from a surf full of surfers who knew nothing about the Holocaust, couldn't have cared left, you know. I, I like the combination of this serious European proposition and a block or two away, good old mindless Aussie surfing. 
fortunately, I had read uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. And another book I'd read, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. It read like fiction. Truman Capote used the term fashion for what he did. Now, I was aware of uneasiness about the interviews of going back. But not only of that wariness, they didn't want this story to be contradicted. And there were two groups who would contradict it. Holocaust denialists, who contradicted the whole phenomenon. And the other group were their own Jewish community who said, Schindler, it's a daydream. I never met a German like him. And so uh, they wanted it to be as unassailable as it could be. I think I thought of the idea before Poldek. We offered them the chance to read it and correct it. Now, this is unprecedented that you to have characters reading your manuscript and correcting it. Three and a half hours of movie, you can't tell as much as a novelist can. And I get a perverse enjoyment out of that fact. The fact that they have their elbow room in the corporate jet, but we have our elbow room in the narrative, and the narrative's far more important than the corporate jet. (laughs) I find it hard to watch that in the movie. When I watch that in the movie, I think, what monster invented this? But I didn't invent it. And Pangevich's pharmacy, uh, the little girl in the red dress who was related to the Dresners and who didn't survive the war. But there were other little girls in red who claimed to have been that little girl. And good on them because there were many children trying to find their way that day of the ghetto clearance. Uh, I remember complimenting Gunter Grass on the tin drum, which he wrote when he was about 29. He was not amused. What about all the other books he'd written? (laughs) So writers are never content. I am reconciled to being identified by that book for this reason, that my capacity to invent a plot is exceeded by the fantastical nature of the Schindler story and its imaginability and its uh, complexity. And for that reason, uh, I know I will never myself create a plot that's as fascinating or as multifaceted, to use that word again, as the, the, the Schindler book. But what a wonderful creative challenge to have that as I get old and feel that I've still got a few books left in me. What a wonderful creative challenge to try to un- unseat the Schindler book in its importance. So that's part of the legacy. That's the personal legacy. The legacy for Jewish people is that everyone Jewish tells me that after the book or the movie, their parents started speaking. And they found out a a number of books worldwide have derived from that experience of the parents speaking and giving testimony. And, of course, it has enabled uh, Spielberg to create an extraordinary, an extraordinary historic archive of the Holocaust, the Shoah Foundation. Just imagine if we could go back to the plague in the 17th century and have people testifying what it was like. In a hundred years, people will be able to research nuances of the issue of the Holocaust from that Shoah Foundation.